All right, everybody, welcome to Progressive Farming with Evan Folds. Go ahead and uh, use the chat feature there to ask any questions you have, or if you're, uh, or if you have any uh, direct questions, you can hit the Q and A button if you're uh, watching the live event with all of us. But uh, otherwise, just go ahead and enter in chat, and we'll catch it there as well. Um, we have uh, Evan's got some special announcements for you today, so that's pretty exciting. And uh, I'm just going to hand it over to you, Evan. Go ahead, man. Yeah, man. Well, uh, yeah, we're, we're uh, happy to announce we're going to be working on a course on uh, soil food web composting, compost tea. Um, you'll leave with everything you need to know. And if you don't, the ability to ask direct questions and uh, understand how to kind of take you growing to the next level biologically. Um, so, you know, if you subscribe to the channel, you're going to get discounts. Uh, you know, we'll let you know all the details as we go. Don't have any firm dates, but just want to ask everybody, you know, go, go to tv.permaethos.com. $29 a year, unlimited access to me, discounts to uh, to the course. Uh, we're also, uh, at this point, you know, you uh, make a product line. I don't talk a lot about it because I'm not here to sell things, but uh, we will give you the ability to have discounts towards our product line as well, which is essentially the, the materials that you'll be able to use to uh, put into action what you've learned, which is really what I'm about. You know, the, the tip of the spear is understanding and perspective and connection and team building and then as we understand and are inspired by the truth of the information beyond what i'm saying we try to give you an experience and then from there uh, an application approach that can really revolutionize what you're doing uh, you know biologically speaking i always ask people to consider try drinking a beer without yeast it's not a beer right uh and make it important really quick so you know the soil food web same with the soil you know the majority of soil out there people are working against the grain compensating for a lack of uh, a team, really. Um, so, you know, that being said, please go to tv.permanentethos.com, support the, the show, and uh, you know, you'll be well rewarded for it. I'll make sure of that. Um, so uh, for today, you can't see my screen yet, right? Um, let me do that. Got a couple of videos I'm going to show you today. What we are going to talk about, this is a fun one for me. This, you know, part of this, um, started in uh, this book. I read your passage the other day. Um, I'm going to read you another today. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of an unconventional approach to a uh, pretty common issue. Uh, who's grown a garden or a farm and not had an issue with pest disease and weeds? Uh, I'm going to guess nobody. And if you have, I want to hear about it because uh, it's you know ubiquitous and it, it comes with the territory right i mean there's an element of uh you know agricultural is a disruptive process um agriculture defines humanity it's, it's not a judgment against agriculture we, we, we have to organize ourselves in a way of maximizing the production and in my world in a business world the, the efficiency of what we're doing um which can be taken to an extreme you know uh to the extent of monocultures and you know, really trying to squeeze uh, the blood out of a stone, if you will. And, and that's really where we're at uh, right now in, in agriculture. And it's quite alarming. You know, I was watching a, 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 a TED talk, which I'll introduce you to when we get into the biological conversation. This is pretty much the culmination of the, the physical and the mineral platform of bioenergetic agriculture. You know, we've talked soil testing, we've talked plant physiology, taxonomy, we've soil structure, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. And, you know, what we're coming to the end of here is kind of the, the, the mineral capacity um, on one level. And what you'll see as we talk through this is that, you know, everything is always intertwined. It's the, the exercise of, of separating them uh, in order to work with them is part of the issue in agriculture. And, you know, dealing with pest disease and weeds is a perfect example of that because, you know, if we, if we think about pests flying by our neighborhood and happen to land on our plants, uh, and that we have bad luck, it's not surprising that we would want to go out and try to kill them, right? Um, so the, the, the real story is, is different. And, and what I've found is that simply by telling the story, it changes our actions. It, it, um, it instills in us that there is a, a different, a fundamentally different way of approaching 
the issues that we're having rather than feeling bad for ourselves and trying to compensate through what we've called toxic rescue chemistry, which is essentially the idea of there's the problem. Now we need to address it. What we're trying to do here is intellectually and perspectively get ahead of the game, right? And, and really ask the questions that allow us to recognize that the pest and the disease and the weeds are doing exactly what they should be doing. Uh, the fact that we can't get down there and have a conversation with them uh, begs some misunderstanding. Um, and that's really what we're going to talk about today is, is we're, we're going to look at it from their perspective. One, um, we're going to ask ourselves, uh, are, are there better ways to approach the issues that we're dealing with? Uh, and, you know, I need to be careful not not to, to overstep the bound of the fact that, you know, these ideas, while they're going to mitigate a lot of the issues that you deal with, there's never a perfect scenario, um, particularly because a lot of the crops that we're growing are seasonally outside of, of, of their endemic uh, posture, you know, where they came from. So it would be like putting putting us in the Arctic uh, versus an Eskimo, you know, they've acclimated, right? Uh, same thing here, you know, what we're looking at is, is, you know, having to take into account the totality of what we're trying to accomplish in order to be better. Um, and, you know, I should also say from the weed perspective, and we'll talk about it a little more intimately when we get there, you know, if you have open ground, you're going to have weeds grow. Um, this is a lot of the reasons why, you know, GMO crops are adopted because of the simplicity of spraying a substance, you know, pervasively across a landscape to kill what you don't want and not kill uh, what you do, um, all while stressing the system while you're at it. Uh, but so, you know, I, I'm going to stop short of making claims of, on an agricultural row crop application, let's say. Weeds are always going to be an issue. Uh, how you choose to deal with them is, is um, you know, a, a different conversation. Um, but we'll have that conversation more in terms of a, a, a native environment um, or a polyculture or permaculture environment or a, a lawn or landscape environment. Uh, and, I, and I think you'll put, pick up what I'm putting down um, because even outside of the actionable part of all of this, the story is pretty darn cool. Um, so William Albrecht, we, we talked about him, uh, base saturation, mineral testing. If you haven't read his work uh, back from the 40s and 50s, um, I highly suggest you do that. I'll put some books for you in the uh, show notes so that you have some resources. Uh, but this was one of his statements, you know, he came at, at, at agriculture from a human nutrition standpoint. And I, I consider myself to be in that boat. You know, the point of agriculture is to nourish people, not to grow food. Um, now, obviously, you've got to run businesses up the, up the chain in order to make that happen uh, to the extent that, you know, one percent of the population is even a farmer anymore. But uh, the reality is that, that food is no longer our medicine. So, you know, all breakfast, insects and diseases are the symptoms of a failing crop, not the cause of it. And that's absolutely right. Uh, and I'm going to give you some, some proof to that uh, as, as we talk through this. Um, so in a, in a very real sense, you know, we, we kind of, if you recall the charts that I showed you on the product earth tonic that we make and, and you compared miracle Grow, and they're easy to pick on, but everybody knows about it, which is kind of why I talk about them. Um, it's fast food, right? And, you know, it's a really good analogy because it's, the fertilizers themselves, I mean, you can get into the inert ingredients and, and try and drill down and the EPA doesn't, you know, uh, mandate the acknowledgement of what those inert ingredients are. And they could be uranium, for, you know, uh, be bad for business. So I, I'm, I'm not supposing that it is, but uh, the fertilizers themselves are not so detrimental, uh, toxic, let's say. But the, the degeneration that ensues by uh using half of what a plant requires. And remember, I like to talk about what a plant wants, not what it has to have. But from a has to have standpoint, when you're adding half of what the plant has to have, and over time you're taking advantage of what the soil can deliver in its native posture, you know, wherever it came from, you, you, you run out of certain elements. It's not rocket science, right? Um, and in a lot of ways, it's the same with fast food. Right? Again, back to the, the perfection of the analogy. You know, I mean, I, I'm sure most of you have heard of these movies have not seen them and uh it's pretty alarming what happens to this guy in super size me when he eats fast food for every meal for a month he's in the doctor he's bloated he's uh lethargic the doctor is concerned uh already signed a waiver that he's not responsible for the work he's being asked to do um and in a lot of ways man we need that in agriculture the problem is uh the doctors of agriculture uh generally speaking, 
aren't equipped with the the level of knowledge they need to consult people into the right posture. And, you know, humbly speaking, this is a, a lot of what I try to bring to the table in the relationships that I build is, is to, to really, you know, trust, but verify. Um, I'm in the middle of a cons consult consultation, excuse me, that, uh, with an organic hydro grower in Washington, and he's using an organic hydroponic nutrient. And, and hydroponics, you, in some ways, you can't micromanage it the way you can with minerals in the soil. You're not really working with individual elements. And this grower has a fertilizer that's working, the plant's growing, but he's not, uh, the numbers on his solution testing are just way off relative to what the soil should be. Now there's a gray area there, but the point I'm driving at here is that, you know, forget what the numbers say. The question is what the crop's doing. Um, and so, you know, these, these types of, of conversations are, are really important, but what wouldn't work is if all the elements weren't there. In hydroponics, if you've got a requirement for, I'm going to say a minimum of, you know, 11 elements, I would say more comfortably 14, um, and you've got seven elements in the fertilizer you're using, the plant won't work. It just won't. What you can take advantage of in soil is that there's residual capacity to hold on to the extra nutrition and fertility that you need that you're not delivering. And that's a lot of the, uh, the ruse. That's what, what kind of yokes us to the, the budget fertilizers from the big box stores is they work good enough to get us down the road. And over time, they work less and it creeps up on you. And in a lot of respects, you don't connect it to the actual fertilizer unless you've really had this conversation uh, with ourselves. So, you know, in that, in that posture, you know, seek these movies out if you hadn't, but I, I wanted to just talk through a couple of ideas. You know, compost piles to go to the landscape. You know, what we're talking about here is a lot simpler than we made it in agriculture. Um, biologically speaking, the future of medicine in my observation is gut driven, the gut brain barrier. Uh, you know, the appendix being the reservoir for we finally figured out what it's, it's used for. You know, for, for generations, we've imagined that we don't need it because we didn't die when we removed it we got appendicitis but it's the reservoir of gut microbes uh, come to find out and um, so you know the point is that you know we are more than ourselves uh, biologically speaking there's more uh, but microbial cells in and on a healthy human than our human cells for example um, it's pretty profound um, so you know I find that these analogies of really thinking about the importance of a compost pile and if you don't have a compost pile the point is you don't have to have one uh, but you have to be con cognizant of the, the biological diversity that is required to shape an ecosystem and empower it to be what it can be. And so compost tea, there's different ways to the same place. But biologically speaking, it's so important to have these microbes in your soil. They don't jump over the fence. They don't parachute in. They're not going to be there unless you, you ask them to be, so to speak, uh, because of the nature of development, nature of chemical lawn care, the nature of chemical fertilizers and toxic rescue chemistry, and, and, and the list goes on. Um, so, you know, that idea, I think, is, is, is really relevant. Um, and in some ways, I'm setting the table for, for the, the specific talk towards the, the pesticides and weeds. Um, wheatgrass is, is something I have a particular expertise with. I imagine at some point we'll probably have a course or, or you know, at least a show on uh, wheatgrass sprouting. Um, I had profound experiences. I don't say it lightly. People that cured their cancer um, that... Uh, yeah, it makes me kind of emotional thinking about it, to be honest with you, because uh, it was our wheatgrass and they'd come in every week and buy a flat and they were, you know, learning to do it themselves and, and they, they healed themselves. Um, and, and the question becomes, well, how does that work, right? Um, well, name something in your diet that is alive with any kind of potency and consistency. It doesn't exist. Um, we're not nourishing ourselves the way our bodies want to be nourished. And that is, is not necessarily... Um, our fault. Uh, I mean, in the end, our responsibility for our health lies with us, but um, it's, it's been bred out of, of the diet of the American citizen, and I would say the global citizen at this point. Um, and wheatgrass is a really obvious, uh, once you get hip to a way of, uh, you know, bringing life force into your diet, one ounce of wheatgrass juice is two and a half pounds of vegetables in terms of its nutrient density. It's unbelievably potent. It's the highest chlorophyll content uh, of, you know, any green plant that I'm aware of. Chlorophyll mimics hemoglobin. It's like a blood infusion. Um, so the point of talking about it was to say that, you know, to draw an analogy for, towards, you know, nourishing ourselves, you know, if, if you eat a fast food diet and you start eating raw foods, it makes you feel amazing. You feel it. Now try to describe that to somebody. I mean, they may be, be able to hear the, the, the tenor of your voice and see it in your eyes and, and trust you on that level, but they, they don't know what that feels like. 
And that's a lot of that lack of experience in that regard. It's a lot of what restricts people from, from having the experience. And so part of what I'm trying to offer today is, is simply that, you know, there's an element of faith in this that generates experience that then makes it second nature. And it's a take it or, you know, leave it kind of scenario. Um, so, you know, and just to kind of drill down on that one, one more level, you know, juicing versus smoothies, I always find this interesting because when we would juice, people would always look at the waste. My wife and I do it, try to do a juice cleanse every year. And, and you know, we buy big boxes of beets and uh, apples and, you know, all, all carrots and all kinds of good stuff. And, and you basically don't eat solid food for as long as you can muster. I think the longest we've ever done it's like six, seven days. And it's, it's an amazing experience. It's kind of a roller coaster because you, you're not calorically full, but man, when you get that juice, you are flying and it, there's n no feeling like it. And it's not just for the feeling, it's a detox really. But, um, you know, the, the, the stats don't lie. The USDA data, you need 26 apples to get the same amount of iron you'd get out of one apple from 1950. The reality is you can't sit there and eat 26 apples. So the point of juicing is to concentrate the nutritional delivery of what we're eating in a way that can't be accomplished through the food that we have access to back to the wheatgrass, right? Um, and so there's nothing wrong with smoothies, but they're going to fill you up before you reach your, your nutritional and nourishment capacity. Anyway, a little anecdote um, that I always find interesting to talk about with people when they're judging the amount of uh, refuse you have from, uh, from juicing. Uh, throw in the compost pile, bring it back to the soil, everybody wins. Um, so, you know, the point of the anecdotal issue is that, you know, the real rubber meets the road when you have the experience. Um, so part of what I, I like to, to offer is, uh, you know, the concept of uh, one, the kind of inextricable tangle of physical, mineral, biological, and energetic capacities. And I think this video really speaks to that. Um, and I'm gonna offer it to you today, not, not for its relevance for pests, weeds, and disease, but because it's amazing to watch and it's, it's a little bit of a meditation. So, uh, you know, let's, let's just enjoy this for a moment. It's, it's pretty cool to watch. How amazing is that? I mean, whoever made that uh, had some serious intention. Uh, but the earth breathes, you know, there are rhythms to life. And on a, on a big, broad level, what, what we're talking about here is, is kind of riding the wave, right? Not fighting the current. And that, that applies from a physical, mineral, biological, and energetic capacity. One of the things that this video really sets the table for is biodynamic agriculture. And we'll talk about that in the energetic realm in the coming months. But, um, you know, the idea being that um, this is a very deliberate thing and it's, it's really up to us. I'll put it this way to believe it or not. Right. Um, I, I try to, to, to not carry the burden of proof, which is impossible. Uh, but the reality is there is, not only is it fascinating, but um, you know, we're not in, uh, invited to imagine these things where we come from in, in education, let's say. Um, and it, it's something that I play around with with my kids, you know, trying to get, I, I get them to watch these videos with me and, and just imagine that. And, and, I, and I often think, uh, no judgment towards my parents, but I, imagine, I often think, you know, what I would be doing if, if I'd been given these tools earlier. And uh, 
to be honest with you, just to speak personally, that for a minute, that's, that's exactly why I do these things is, you know, hopefully in some way th these influences rub off on others and, and, you know, you can pay it forward. And so this is another cool one within that concept. Um, if you never heard of cymatics, uh, this is, this is really neat. Check this out. It's, uh, you know, form follows frequency. Let's keep that in mind. The film you are about to see has no characters. If you spare a little of your imagination, it is a film to describe to you the effect of cymatic frequencies on matter. pause it on the break because I need every minute of, of uh, on the bridge, I should say. Um, I need every minute of the day, but you know, that's amazing, right? Um, not only is it entertaining, but to, but to see the way the physical substance orients based on the vibrations it's associated with, man, if you can just take that and run with it, it'll, uh, it'll change your life, change mine. Um, so, you know, how, how does that come into reality from an agricultural standpoint. One is bio, biodynamic agriculture, it's basically frequency farming, or what I call a field spray, uh, the, the concept of potentization. You know, we'll get into a lot of this in, in the energetic realm, but you know, there's a product, you may have heard of it, called Sonic Bloom. Um, it's really difficult to create a control around it because you, know, you really have to have soundproof rooms, and I've never really taken it to that level. But I, I did have an opportunity before Dan Carlson, who in, invented this uh, approach. Um, after he passed, I had the opportunity to distribute the product. His son is a, a bit of a, a live wire, let's say. Uh, never really kind of got in bed there. But the bottom line is, um, it's fairly established. There's a whole chapter in the book, Secrets of the Soil, that discusses it. And it, it makes sense, you know, his insight initially was that there are frequencies that plants are associated with in a natural environment that if we're aware of them can be expounded upon. Think, uh, you know, the air is 400 parts per million CO2. Uh, you know, if you increase a grow room that uh, can be controlled to 1600 parts per million, you literally, you can almost sit there and watch the plant grow. And I could go off probably for an hour about how that creates questions for me about climate change and CO2 being a contaminant. Why doesn't it just make the plants grow faster? Um, but, you know, carrying the burden of proof on that, uh, good luck with that. Uh, but the reality is, you know, what he was essentially treading towards is that through specific vibrations, it invited the plant to open up. 
and the way he described it, which is a little surface and not satisfying, uh, is that it opened up the pores of the plant. And then he developed a foliar spray that complemented it. That, um, you know, when you played the, the music and it's, it's like not music you would probably choose to listen to, but it was maybe some kind of classical, most like, uh, not non, I don't know. I'm judging it, but it's everybody has their taste. But say it's classical music, but it has this like wee 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 in the background. It's very strange. Um, but combine those frequencies with the foliar spray, and you get pretty massive uh, increases in plant growth. So I offer that, you know, mostly as just a a specific example of how some of these concepts have been brought to market. Uh, so. Um, you know, to be honest with you, oh, here, I actually put in, this is what it sounds like. Shot of a dog there, right? Turn it up. Not sure what's trying to be accomplished. And the music that it's normally associated with is not there, but uh, that's enough of that. You get the picture. Um, you know, how he put that, it, it, you know, came to those frequencies is, is a bit of a longer story. And, you know, if you hadn't get a copy of Secrets of the Soil, if you need one, you can get it at microbemakers.com uh, in the books and media section, but you can probably find it at your local library. It, it's, it's definitely a worthy read. Um, so, you know, before we get into some of the specifics around pests, weeds, and disease, uh, we're already at 4.30, um, I would uh, mention this earlier, but I, I just wanted it as a, a manner of vocabulary to offer it. You know, Charles Walters is a has founded Acres USA, and you can get a subscription for like twenty nine dollars a year. Do it; it's unbelievable information. If you can go to their conference, it's held normally uh, in the winter, somewhere in the Midwest. Uh, highly uh, suggest it. Hadn't been in many years, too many years, but I used to go every year. And what the downloads that I got, and the you know, the 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 uh, space that was being held for, for progressive and what I call bioenergetic agriculture is really the only place I've ever found uh, that that respected it to the level that that um, that it should. Uh, so you know this concept of, of con toxic rescue chemistry, you know, compare that to to, to balance and diversity. Uh, those things bring that equals fertility. All right. Um, in, in my book, balance and diversity are really the key concepts. Strength and diversity. Um, nature works through balance. So, you know, that's that's about as simple as you can make a regenerative, bioenergetic, progressive uh, concept. And, you know, one of the efforts in all of this is to try to simplify it. So hopefully that that uh, resonates with you. Um, so, you know, this, this is kind of where we're at. Right. Um, you got the same crop growing in lines. You got uh, airplanes spraying pesticides that kill uh, what we don't want, weeds, uh, and uh, don't kill what, what we do want. Uh, I mentioned earlier, obviously it's still stressing the system, which is really from a, a, a proper perspective, uh, the point of the plant is in where its strength comes from. When that responsibility is pawned off to, to humanity, um, we're making a mess of it, man, you know, and, you know, things like, you know, wearing hazmat suits to, to spray chemicals. I mean, does this really make sense and to who? Um, so, you know, is it understandable how we got to this point? You know, I think that's safe to say. Uh, no, no help in, in, in judging and in trying to blame. Uh, it's more about of what to do about it, right? I mean, there's, there's, here's a humorous uh, angle towards it. Um, so, you know, I've already mentioned this, but, you know, the big fish eats the little fish, uh, except for when they operate in, in resonance. And, uh, you know, that image is probably more important than the other aspects of what I wrote here, because I've already kind of referenced it. But let's look at this from a, a, a pest standpoint. You know, this is a white fly in the upper right, uh, spider mites in the bottom left, aphids down there in the bottom right. Everybody that's grown a, a garden or uh, any kind of commercial application, is, I'm sure, has had these kinds of issues. Um, I'm just now gaining access to some really revolutionary pest control products that can help people uh, work with these problems. And so what we're talking about here today and what I tried to acknowledge in the, up front was that, you know, you can do all of the right things from a, a position of diversity and balance and still end up with a pest infestation. 
uh, particularly when we're working with soil that needs to be regenerated. This is a seasonal approach. It doesn't happen overnight, uh, which is you know, part of the calibration that we need to understand in order to be successful. If our expectation is everything's supposed to be better tomorrow, then you know, good luck on that. Same with your diet, right? You start eating better and, and changing your diet and changing your ways, and it can take a year to get your result if you're approaching it from a medicinal standpoint. So it's, it's so important to, to understand that in terms of managing expectations. But pests are bad luck. Uh, it turns out they're attracted to unhealthy plants. Uh, I'm gonna show you why uh, in some ways in, here in a minute. And it's something that's really interesting to know is that, that pests are, uh, they cannot digest a complete protein. Um, so, you know, I wanna tell you a little story about proteins. Um, one that's fascinating, it's like if you strengthen the plant from the inside, it doesn't represent a food source for pests. I mean, that, that should hit in some, some level on com common sense, right? Um, but metabolically speaking, it's interesting to understand why. And so, you know, what we're really dealing with is, is conventional agriculture creates obesity in plants. And this is what pests and disease are feeding on. It turns out the irony is that that obesity can be evaluated as a benefit. You know, if you've got to take a lawn, if it's growing stronger and faster, some people might complain having to mow it more. But generally speaking, that's considered a good thing. Uh, so you can pump a lawn full of nitrogen and you know, think you're winning. But the reality is you're creating a buffet for pests and disease and we don't live in a bubble, right? So, you know, with that understanding, you know, why, how does that work? So this is an image of an amino, amino acid and we won't get technical in terms of which one, but it's basically defined by a nitrogen base pair. Uh, you can't have, you don't have an amino acid without a nitrogen. So uh, the uniqueness comes through uh, the, the the difference in the chain, um, but this nitrogen is, is ubiquitous. So, so what happens is when you are force feeding, I'll say a, a crop or a lawn or whatever you have with, with an, a nitrogen fertilizer, like, you know, think uh, you know, anhydrous ammonia, all it is is nitrogen. And, and in a lot of agricultural applications, this is all they're using in order to create a yield, which it can do through obesity, right? Um, so what you're doing is, you, is you're forcing the plant to produce amino acids. It's uptaking the, the soluble nitrogen, which is ubiquitous through the soil. There's no diversification on when the plant can eat what. It's just being flooded with this food. And so it's growing and it's obese. And it's basically got all of these empty proteins because amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So you see like, you know, the, the complexity of a protein is defined by how it's kind of like DNA in a loose way, you know. The, the, the way the chain is oriented and then the chemistry of how it comes together three-dimensionally defines the protein. And there's exponential ways in which that can happen. So the point is not to figure it all out, but you know, we know a lot about this uh, having said that. So the idea here is if the, the metabolism of the plant can't keep up with the input of nitrogen in terms of its amino acid pro, uh, um, development, um, manufacturing, I guess I should say, um, you have all of these empty proteins. These, these broken proteins, these amino acids. And it turns out that they vibrate in the range of formaldehyde and ammonia in the infrared. And it actually attracts as the, the pests, they see the food. Now, pretty far out, I, I know, but um, the reality is that there's people that have spent a lot of time documenting this. Um, so, you know, let's investigate first. Uh, I have a lot of experience in lawn care because I had an organic lawn care company for three years. It was kind of an all R and D trip for me. You know, we did we used our compost tea recipe. That's where I developed our, our fertility management services, our base saturation soil testing, did thousands of soil tests in my area and learned from it. Right. Um, and we had clients all over the place. We have really poor soil here and, and clients all over the place with mole cricket, chinch bug, ground pearl. Um, you know, maybe you, you haven't heard of some of those uh, depending on where you live, but they're all three of these are everywhere around me. And, Chemicals don't kill them. And the reason is, if you look at the life cycle of the chinch bug, you can get a chemical and you can kill this larvae, right? But you can't kill the adult. So what happens is that the life cycle, just to take the chinch bug, is intermittent. You don't have them all larvae and all adults at one time. In other words, you can't go out and kill everything because they're not all larvae at the same time. So they have this armor, as do the mole cricket, as does the ground pearl. So the chemicals don't work and you get lawn care companies telling you you got to replace your whole landscape because you can't get rid of a target pest. Well, <laughs> what's wild is I've cured these issues over and over and over. Uh, I mean, seasonally speaking, 
by strengthening the grasp of trace mineral fertilization and biologically speaking, primarily through the application of beneficial nematodes. So the idea is the nematode attacks the larvae when it's vulnerable. It subsists in the soil. Most of the chemicals that we're allowed to spray don't have a residual nature because, and thankfully so, because then they'd subsist in the ecosystem. So the legislation is that, you know, say it's got at most a three day residual. Well, that means that when you spray that, unless you're spraying it every three days, it's got to be a perfect timing, which is just unrealistic. So having said all of that, you can get rid of basically every issue that you deal with. And, and we'll talk about it from a lawn care perspective in this context. Uh, just using biological approaches uh, from a diversity and balance standpoint. Um, so, you know, just a small example, you know, this is some ground pearl damage. Um, they're really good at what they do. Uh, you know, this is a pretty famous image of an electron microscope of a beneficial fungi capturing a lesionous nematode. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of parasitic nematodes around us as well. A lot of flower farms. The Dutch moved into our area a uh, long time ago and, and they stayed around some of the farmland about really where our warehouse is. And they all steam their soil trying to sanitize it and they battle parasitic nematodes every single season. And it's really difficult to get through to them because they've been doing it for a hundred years. Um, but you know, something that we're working on. But it's interesting to, to see this. This is a, a, an image of a snapshot of balance. This is the point. If we introduce the good guys, they're gonna balance out the bad. It's not about killing everything because then we kill what we don't want to kill as well, right? Vicious cycle. Um, moles are another one, you know? People chase the mole around. You got so, sonar frequency generators in your landscape. And, uh, you know, I, I've been told by golf course managers that juicy fruit works really well. Just FYI, that's not my favorite you know, approach, but it gums them up. So pretty cruel, but, you know, uh, as is nature. Um, but the, the bottom line is that the, the mole is not digging through the earth for nothing. Uh, you see the, the grubs, if you got 20 per square foot, like in that image on the left there, uh, it's not surprising that the moles come in for it because they've got a sonar. They can see the food. Uh, they see the buffet in your yard. And literally speaking, consistent compost tea applications with beneficial nematodes, uh, which should be included in any kind of food web uh, complete product. Uh, those nematodes are munching on those grubs, getting rid of the food source. So rather than trying to kill the mole away, let's get rid of his food. And the, uh, and the reality is they, they don't come to your yard. It's really that simple. Uh, people report all the time with our tea recipe, you know, the neighbors aren't, the, the neighbors got all the moles now uh, and then they're quite happy about it. Um, so, you know, I mentioned earlier about the food source. This is, this is a uh, Dr. Phil Callahan. He uh, did a lot of work on, um, he was an entomologist. He was also a frequency guy from his time in the military and he combined those uh, capacities to spend his life researching uh, the connection between vibrational attractants of pests. Um, in, a, in a simple way of talking about it, think about like a, the light attracting the bugs on the deck at night sort of thing. Um, so, you know, we can see this stuff. Uh, let's just connect some dots. Um, so literally, they, the infrared frequency is how inf insects find their way around. Uh, I'll, I'll include this link in, in the show notes so that you can kind of dig in. We don't really have time today to go all the way down the rabbit hole, but safe to say that he documented very specific app applications where the deficiencies and excessive approaches uh, outside of the balance of, of a natural uh, system uh, stimulate pests and, and provide food source on one hand, but also vibrationally show them where it is. Really quite revolutionary. And the, the way that that works is basically the antenna of pests. Uh, I can't remember if this was a white fly. I think it is. I, I didn't write myself a note, but uh, point is, this is an electron microscope of the antenna of a, of a target pest, and it works not unlike a, a TV antenna on a, on a home, um, old school at least. Um, so, you know, again, at least that can make some level of sense. Now, you know, the detail that you may be interested in, you know, may come through a couple more uh, rounds of, of investigation, but uh, you can see you know, I, uh, I think this is a, f a fly of some sort. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Again, I didn't write myself a note, but it's, it's kind of cool to look at. And you can imagine that, you know, uh, that the, the cilia here of, of these appendages is, 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 has a capacity to pick up frequency. And then how that's articulated to the pest gives them information. Uh, it's not like an eardrum for that matter, right? It's like, how does a vibration that travels through the air be translated into what you're hearing not, well, 
just had the thought of having have it happen through a computer, which is a whole nother level. Um, but you get the point. Um, so some of his books are, uh, you know, uh, I've read Tuning Into Nature. I actually have Exploring the Spectrum, but haven't investigated them. I think that's a little bit more deeper. Um, so both both of these, you know, just because I know uh, Dr. Callahan's work, I would recommend, and they'll really they'll blow your mind. Uh, they'll they'll be in the show notes as well. Uh, so this is just a small anecdotal, not not proof, but I, I planted this bed. This was in front of my old garden center, Progressive Gardens, and and we planted this bed and fortified the uh, right half of it with our products: uh, Earth Recharge, Earth Tonic diversity from an elemental standpoint, compost teas, that kind of thing. And the left was just the potting soil and it got, uh, I can't remember if it got fertilizer or not, but the point is there was plenty in the soil as it started. And this chard, uh, is either that or, is that bok choy? I mean, this was, I don't know, over a decade ago. But um, what was really interesting is that, you know, as it matured, the plant on the left uh, was getting munched on, man. It was getting destroyed by something, and we could never find what it was, some kind of caterpillar or something. I'm not really sure. Um, but the plant on the right was completely untouched. Um, does that prove merit? No. Uh, it's interesting, though. And, and, you know, it's important to think about these things. You know, the other capacity, and I, you know, I won't go too far down this road. We could probably do a whole talk on this alone, is beneficial insects. There's a lot of commercial applications uh, and, and greenhouses that I'm aware of that uh, when they start to grow, they actually introduce the pest species so that they can sustain the beneficial species. In other words, if you put the beneficial species in a greenhouse that's inert, how long are they going to be around, right? They got nothing to eat. So engineering that balance is the name of the game. Um, that happens a little bit more naturally, obviously, when you're not uh, controlling the environment uh, and, and particularly through polyculture and, and permaculture approaches where you've got, you know, companion planting and you've got the ability to, you know, some plants being uh, a, a host for, for beneficial species that are there simply for that purpose. Um, so, you know, look, if you haven't uh, look into some uh, beneficial insects, you can order them online, get some ladybugs and, and watch them do their thing. It's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, I've lost hours, uh, you know, with a microscope and a, and a grow room watching little uh it's, it's actually not the, the ladybug that eats as much they do eat some but the the larvae that they have uh, they're like little alligators and the, man they're just like <laughs> mowing through aphids it's a trip praying mantises are fun too you know especially if you have kids order them and hatch them and let the kids uh, like 200 mantids all running all over you and they're like that big um a lot of fun uh it's really really kind of cool so, you know, you can see some of the, all of these green lace wings are, are, are pretty uh, broad spectrum. There's some targeted things. And then there's also pests that will basically eat anything like a mantis. Uh, you know, they documented praying mantises eat birds and hamburger and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so this is the, uh, you know, how big the little alligator uh, ladybugs are. That's what their eggs look like in the top right. Um, and you can see the, the larvae can't fly. Um, but it very quickly, when you get the ladybugs, they'll start to lay the eggs, which you can see, and then they'll hatch and then grow up into to, uh, mature uh, larvae, and they just uh, have at it. This is a video I was going to show you and didn't uh, set up, but I'll include it in the show notes. It's, it's really just like 10 minutes of bugs eating. <laughs> it's, it's really cool. It's quite satisfying, actually. Um, so you can see this is a green lacewing. They're mobile and the best ones are mobile, lay their eggs and then move on. And basically they're just looking for somewhere to invite their, uh, their children to have food, which is what we want. This is a, a spider mite being eaten, eaten by a predator mite. Uh, and this is on a, on a minute scale. You can barely see this stuff happening. Um, but you can, again, you can order all of this online. Uh, I put an image in of the praying mantis. Oh yeah. Whoa. Watch out. And, I should say, have you ever met a pest that can look you in the eye like a praying mantis? If you ever met one, you know what I mean. Totally, they'll kind of cock their head at you and stare you down. It's really, really wild. Um, let's see how much time we have here. Yeah, so I'll give you a taste of this, but I'm, I'm going to have to burn through this to get get through some of this information. But this is uh, David Attenborough. I'm going to put you to sleep for a second. Including other mantids. Time to 
leave. This tiny insect is now open to attack from predators lurking in the undergrowth. Whether an individual mantis survives or not is partly a matter of chance. Whether it's spotted by a predator. Star Wars. Whether it turns right or left. So far, its luck has held. But this... Of course, it's all bluff. Trying to look bigger and confuse its enemies. So you get the idea. Um, again, I'll let you watch that in the, in the notes, but um, menaces are cool. So we've referenced disease. Uh, in so, some ways, this is the easiest one to conceptualize because it's not like people get pest infestations. Well, I say that. You'd be amazed how many people have parasitic uh, worms in their intestines. Do a salt cleanse and hold on tight. Um, but you know, disease is, is ubiquitous in, in society. And I am a firm believer that, uh, you know, trace mineral fertilization, you know, I say it all the time, if it's not in the soil, it's not in the plants, not in the plants, not in the people, right? And that alone is the reason and the answer for modern degenerative and autoimmune disease. I, I'm firmly convinced of that. Now, can I prove that to you? No. Um, and, and that in and of itself is why things are the way that they are. But in a very real sense, we've all had our own experiences, either directly or indirectly, with people that we know and love that have helped themselves through changing their diet, even if it's just from a weight loss standpoint, right? Um, so, you know, that that probably makes common sense right out of the bat. Um, and from a plant perspective, you know, we've, we've looked at the, um, the concept of the rhizosphere uh, on the surface when we're talking plant uh, anatomy and, and uh, physiology, and, you know, this is kind of very small uh, environment, say a millimeter outside of, of the outside of the, the physical plant root system is called the rhizosphere. And there's an engagement for what's called mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, these fungi work to not only help the plant eat as an extension of the root, uh, it's basically free roots. You know, the plant didn't have to expend the energy to grow it, yet it's helping in nutrient cycling. It's feeding off the exudates to the plant, which is up to 50%, sometimes 70% estimated for some crops that are exuded into the soil to attract these species of fungi to help them. Uh, it's in a lot of, of, of gardening products uh, at, at this point, and I'd highly recommend people playing around with mycorrhizae. It can be the difference between um, a successful crop and, and not. 99.9% um, .9 of species, plant species can take advantage they don't have to have them present to grow. It's not like an essential element kind of thing. Um, but you know, this idea of, of, of leveraging the, the uh, engagement of microbes with plants is, is really powerful. That's what I spent a lot of time talking about in, in my day job. Um, so this is kind of another image of it. You can see this is the, there's endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae. The endo actually pierces the root and feeds off the exudates. And then in response, in, in return, uh, it acts as the extension of the root. So it provides a growth benefit. Ec ectomycorrhizae is not so much going to help on the growth benefit end, but it surrounds the root. It's basically kind of a, a force field, if you will, to continue the Star Wars analogy. Um, and so, you know, what you get there is, is protection. And, you know, mycorrhizae is an easy way to talk about it. But, you know, I sold these two products in, in Progressive Gardens. It was you know, I'll say up front, both of them have been purchased by Big Ag. Um, I think Syngenta, um, Bayer, and I don't know the specifics, I can't remember, but it was one of the things that, you know, just for, for what it's worth, when, when I closed down my gardening center, uh, there was a confliction because when I started, it was all people doing the right thing, small businesses, you were happy to support them. And then by the time I finished 15 years later, a lot of the best products had been purchased and internalized and, and begun to be patented and leveraged towards larger 
agricultural applications, which is not surprising, but um, you know, both of these organisms here are, are bacteria, uh, very selective towards disease control uh, as fungicides and bacterial sides. Um, so the takeaway is these bacteria are in healthy soil. And you can concentrate them in a lab and make a product out of it to a concentration that nature would never be able to accomplish in her balance. Um, but the point is, if, if you're you're using a complete food web, for example, and you're strengthening the plant and it's got its teammates, there's no need for these products, which is kind of a, just an interesting way to look at it. So to kind of culminate here, let's talk about weeds. This is where it started for me in terms of this mindset. Uh, you know, we evaluate weeds from a perspective of a plant in the wrong place. The reality is, it, it, you know, soil microbes and weeds are the only mechanisms that nature has to mature the soil. And let's face it, everywhere humans tread is soil that's immature. So what you have is, you know, think about a, if you burned an acre, what would first start to grow are the annual weeds, then the perennial turf, then the shrub, then the tree. That's what we call succession, right? And that first annual posture, make the connection that, that seasonal weeds are annual plants. They grow very aggressively to complete their life cycle uh, in, in a short period of time in order to reseed. Um, so what they're doing by growing aggressively, if you've ever tried to pull a dandelion up, it's got an enormous taproot. Uh, it goes way down to the middle of the earth and it's pulling up primarily. I mean, it's, I'm going to make it uh, black and white, but there's more going on. Um, this is oversimplified, but dandelions grow for calcium. We'll talk about them in, a, in just a second. So what it's doing is the, the ecosystem is recognizing what's deficient and the soil microbes can get to work building that um, on their own route. And then the weeds are growing to regenerate that balance in the topsoil. And as we talked about, when we talked about Albrecht's work, there's a very deliberate sweet spot in the balance of the exchange capacity. So, you know, with that knowledge, what, what, what I saw when I did thousands of soil tests locally was we got to the point where we could actually uh, suggest what the deficiencies were in the landscape before we took the soil test based on the weed spectrum. It was that direct. Um, so they're literally, you know, medicinal herbs for the landscape, not unlike how they are for us. I mean, people use all sorts of weeds as tonics and, uh, you know, uh, to supplement their diet. Uh, you know, just go talk to a forager and it'll blow your mind what's, what you're walking over in your yard every day. Uh, so I wanted to give you a couple of examples. You've probably seen chickweed before. Uh, it's one of the most common weeds. It's, you can eat it. It's tasty. Uh, it's a good source of, of nutrition. You can see some of the nutritional profile. Uh, so for example, uh, plantain is another one. You've probably seen this one before. Uh, Native Americans, Americans call it the white man's foot. Um, and, you know, it's kind of an interesting anecdote to, to say that they, they named that because it was where the white man went. And what do we leave in our wake? You know, we, we leave uh, bad diets and, and poor soil. Uh, so I, I, that makes me laugh a little bit. Uh, again, an overgeneralization, but you know, look into uh, nutrition and physical degeneration um, by Western Price and uh, argue with that concept. Uh, I'll put that in the show notes because uh, that's a, a good reference. But uh, the um, you can see how it's used uh, for for its properties. So it turns out weeds actually have a really high nutritional profile of very specific elements, which is why uh, livestock go after it, you know, when they're being taken across the road to, to a different field, they know exactly what they need and they know where to get it. They just can't tell us. Uh, so dandelion, there's its taproot. Uh, you know, my mom drinks a dandelion tea uh, for calcium. So, you know, these things are direct and it's, you can see in that, in that posture, it's a lot simpler than we made it really. Uh, and, you know, just consider that, you know, we don't live in a bubble. Like I said, Look at a dandelion. We've all blown them as kids and adults, right? And so that the mindset is the, the, the neighbor's yard is bringing all the weeds into my landscape or, you know, I got all the weeds from the mulch that I bought. And, you know, is that true on some level? Probably, but the reality is, and I learned this at Acres through a, a, a weeds is my guardian. I'm going to put that one in there as well. Um, that, you know, uh, weeds can stay dormant for up to 50 years in the soil. So the, the idea that seasonally they're coming into your landscape is not actually accurate. Um, it's, it's, it's more complex than that. And really we're chasing our tail if that's our, our, our mindset. Uh, so hopefully you know, that the point is made there. So let me just read you a, a, a little passage uh, from Secrets of the Soil. And uh, okay. Uh, 
All right, today, this new research has laid bare various never before considered anomalies and curiosities. If bundle flower, for, for instance, is planted separately from its natural neighbors, it is found to be prone to a splash-borne fungus bombarded from the earth below and to the underside of its leaves, which are attacked and pruned from the bottom up by the fungal infection. The usual reaction of plant breeders is to such a situation, Jackson ironically explained, is to launch into a seven-year, highly expensive program to breed resistance to that particular pathogen into the plants, tying up the services of a whole crew of geneticists and plant tenders, but when my people had a close look at our native prairie to see how bundle flowers were faring in natural conditions, they were found completely free of the ubiquitous fungus because the entire grassy mat surrounding them absorbed the bombarding raindrops blasters to which the plants were naturally resistant and thus protected the bundle flowers from attack. So it's clear in the first instance is that plant specialists can volunteer to be heroes in a needless battle, while in the second they can, with less bravado, take advantage of nature's wisdom to manage easily and costlessly an otherwise ominous threat. This illustrates the elegance of horticultural simplicity. It shows up the difference between a natural complexity in native prairies and a complication in man's so-called scientific approach. Um, so it, I mean, it, that's uh, just one little anecdote of the chapter in this book, but you know, how hard are we trying to get uh, a, an inferior result? Uh, you apply that to agriculture, and I, and I think you, you kind of get a whiff of, of, of what we're working against there. So, you know, here's some principal ideas to kind of take with you. That, you know, any increase in biodiversity is likely to help reduce the problem. That, if that's not, you know, a central permaculture principle, uh, I don't know what is. It's where the cliche of strength and diversity comes from. It's not a cliche for nothing. Um, you know, there are incidental and residual benefits to the adopted strategies other than the main goal, which is, you know, the takeaway from the passage that I just read you. Read to you, you know, let's go about genetically modifying and doing a decade of research and spending millions of dollars to change nature in a way that in the end is only going to be a window of opportunity towards any sort of seeming benefit. Uh, and that, that in, a, in a nutshell is biotech in my evaluation. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to entertain a discussion with someone who thinks otherwise, but I, I've never, never found one to be satisfying uh, personally. Um, you know, there are unintended repercussions of using toxic rescue chemistry. It is a vicious cycle. It is, you know, it is creating a level of responsibility for ourselves that if we even try to remove our pocketbook and our energy from maintenance, that it gets away from us. Uh, a food forest, or, you know, for example, is a completely opposite idea. And, uh, you know, if you haven't watched the, the I'm, I'm very taken by the centropic ag agriculture, um, Put that in the, in the notes, show notes as well in case you hadn't seen it. And there's a lot of other good ones out there, but this one's just particularly compelling. Um, of the deliberate, uh, you know, approach to developing permaculture applications. Um, and it's not as hard as, as we've made agriculture, but it is fundamentally different. And in, in, in my experience and understanding, really, it takes a, a spiritual conversion from, you know, where we're coming from in a materialistic world driven by ego and bottom line um, and in a lot of ways a race to the bottom line uh, and a race to the bottom uh, i guess you should say um, to one of balance and diversity right um, so you know the other thing to keep in mind is, is if you do need to apply pest control disease control um, not so much weed control uh, there are biological and and you know let's say organic uh, alternatives to toxic chemicals there's always an answer. Uh, it may be more expensive, but the point is, if you do it right, you don't need to use it forever. It's a bridge. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. Um, pest disease and weeds are not bad luck. Encourage life, not death. Change your diet and take a probiotic. I think that's really, really what we're talking about here. Um, so next week, we're going to go down the road of the soil food web and learn about microbes. And uh, we'll get into some composting, some compost tea, kind of wet the whistle for the uh, course that we're uh, ginning up for you. And uh, after that is the energetic realm. And with that, uh, almost exact, it's 501. So I appreciate you guys hanging. And if there's any questions, I'd uh, love to hear them.